satisfaction of a novel when you when I hope there are so. linked right. short stories. Right. What is it about the form as a writer that, that you like? Well, you know, for me, it's like I think it's part of the way my head works for a certain kind of book. And, and with Olive Kittredge, I understood that um, it was going to be episodic because she was explosive. <laughs> That's what she demanded, the form. Um, and then to give the reader breaks from her, you know, with other people in the community. So, you know, <laughs> really. Um, and so that's sort of how that emerged. And, but I always understood right away that it would be in that form, and it was interesting. And then with um, this book, it's a similar thing, although this is more that everybody gets their spotlight, and then, but it's woven in. And it, it, I saw it all as one piece. I saw it all as one piece of material. Um, with different moments for the people. The link, of course, is Lucy Barton, but it's also the town yeah. itself. It's the town. Right. And the town is not in Maine. It's nope. in Illinois. Why is that? Because people do associate you with Maine, especially right. because of Olive Kitteridge. Why did right. you choose the place in the Midwest? Because when I was first writing Lucy Barton, one of the very first moments when I had her with her mother in the hospital, I just understood, and I was trying to figure out who's this mother going to be and then who is Lucy going to be and I was realizing, okay, the level of their poverty and stuff and I really saw, I just saw Sky, that Lucy had grown up with Sky in a way that you, in Maine you don't grow up with Sky, I mean there is the Sky, but you don't grow up with it yeah. you know? like in, in the Midwest it's Sky, and so I saw that, and I saw this little tiny house, and this Sky right. so, um so there she was. And maybe you can give some of Lucy's background. It, as you mentioned, she grew up in right. terrible so Lucy, poverty. Right, so Lucy Barton, in My Name is Lucy Barton, grew up in terrible poverty. And she um, left. She stayed in school, after school, to, to be warm, actually, is why she originally stayed in the schools. But then, as a result, she read a lot. And, um, and so she got into college, and she left. Um, and she ended up living in New York City and becoming a writer, which was like kind of crazy for me to do that, but I did. And so, um, she, but I was interested in the class differences. I was interested in what it felt like for her to go from such extreme poverty and isolation and then become arguably an upper middle class woman. Um, that was interesting to me. Yeah. And of course, we learn in this book that everybody in the town had an opinion about yeah. about the Bartons. Of course, they did. One of the nicely sisters, one of the not so nice nicely right. sisters, <laughs> uh, you know, said to Patty at one point they're talking about them, and she said, "Well, they were just trash. Don't you remember? They were just trash." And the janitor at the school remembers her staying after school and reading, and he felt very protective of her. And, and that made me wonder um, if. Part of this book is to introduce us to these characters more, but also to sort of finish Lucy's story in a way. And you still leave it a little mysterious, but to sort of complete her story in some way. Right. I, I don't know that I was thinking about completing Lucy's story. I was really thinking about these people. Yeah. But I think it does, in a way, if you want to. Well, what I liked, one thing I loved about Lucy Barton uh, is... Um, that the relationship between the mother and Lucy remains kind of mysterious. And uh, you fill in a lot of the details in this book, but you leave a lot of things unanswered still. And I wondered about that choice you make to leave things not completely clear. And right. that happens a lot in short stories, but even in the novel, I think right. you did that. Right, I, I did. And, um, and I did that deliberately. Lucy is a particularly porous book, I think. I think of it as porous. And I think, um, I've always thought that, you know, every reader brings their own life experiences to whatever they're reading. And so they will be reading a different book right. than the person who's reading the same book. But with Lucy Barton, I really wanted to leave enough space so that the reader could really enter into that experience without having to feel that they were being pushed out. Yeah. In Lucy Barton, there's a, there's a whole section about writing. And in this book, there's, there's, there's a story that's really about reading. And the reader is Patty Nicely. And the book is Lucy Barton's memoir. And I don't know whether it was called My Name is Lucy Barton, <laughs> this memoir. Probably. <laughs> Why not? Uh, but um, I, Patty Nicely says something really interesting about 
having read this memoir, she says, this book understood me. She doesn't say Lucy Barton understood me. She says, this book understood me. And I, I wanted to ask you about that. What did you mean by that? Well, I don't know. Haven't you sometimes read a book that you feel like it understands you? That's, that's what I thought Patty Nicely was getting from that experience, that the book became her friend. And it changed the way she thinks yes. about things. Yes, it did. And she, she, the, the, the sort of her takeaway, I think, is Lucy Barton's mother was not a nice woman, was not nice to her daughter, and yet somehow Lucy Barton loved her mother. And, but she says to some, another character, we all love with an imperfect love. And I sort of felt like, is that a lot about what you think this book is about and what these characters? I do. I think, I think My Name is Lucy Barton is a lot about imperfect love. And I think this book is about imperfect love. I guess all my books are about imperfect love. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, think about it now. <laughs> so, what is it that you want people to take away about these characters and that idea that, you know, life can't be perfect? I think that's a little bit right. what you're saying also. Right. Um, exactly. I mean, I, I guess I wanted people to go into the lives of the people in this town and experience maybe parts of themselves the way that we can when we go to fiction and we think, oh, I didn't know anybody else thought that. And then also to, um, to recognize, hopefully just even for a moment, that somebody whose life is very different from theirs, they're real people. Right. I mean, I know they're made up, but they're not. I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> so, like, my hope is that that people can, you know, be more empathic as a result of reading about people that aren't like them. And I've talked to a lot of writers about characters, and for some, they'll say, no, they don't talk to me, you know, that's... But other people, for other writers, they'll talk very much about how the characters become real to them. It sounds right. like you're that kind of right. writer. Right, I, you know, I don't think that... The characters talk to me. I just want to make that clear. It's not Good. like I go into. <laughs> I just want to make sure that we all understand. That it's not like I enter a fugue state or anything. <laughs> no, I'm always aware that I'm writing. I'm always aware <laughs> that I am making these people up. But they do seem very real to me yeah. as they emerge. Well, I read a profile of you in The New Yorker where you talked about having an experience when you were young yeah. where you felt, and it was the first time this happened, where you, a woman was telling you a story and you felt like you merged with her in some way. Maybe okay. you can explain that, yeah, that what was, you it told was a the, funny. It was a funny thing, and it's a little hard to describe even. Um, but when I was 12, I was working at a country store in Maine, and this woman came in, and she was probably, you know, mid-50s, but of course she seemed old to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, um, <laughs> but but she came in and she started she started to talk to me, and I also I find that a little interesting that she talked to me so openly, but she did, and she told me about her husband had had a stroke and that he'd been very depressed ever since his stroke, and and I really felt I can remember sort of feeling like like her molecules were moving a little bit and I was moving into them. <laughs> You know, not really, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, I felt a sense of like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting it. I'm, in, you know, I'm becoming her almost. Was that sort of when you was that is that a feeling that you have when you're creating characters? I mean, is it the same kind of a feeling? Well, um, no, because I'm alone when I'm creating the characters. So, <laughs> right. You know, but 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 it's certainly the impulse to know what it's like to be another person has always been my driving force because, you know, we don't know what it's like and we never will know. And that dress drives me crazy. Yeah. Because, you know, it's just amazing. We won't know what it's like to be another person. We only know what life is like through our own eyes. And that just, I just, drives me crazy. So I make it up. <laughs> <laughs> so you grew up in Maine, but you live in New York now. Um, you base part of one of your books in, in New York, but mostly, you've, the, 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 well, in Olive Kittredge and in these two books, you focus it on a small town. Right. What is it about a small town that allows well, you to... you know, first of all, I came from small towns, so I think it's just, you know, imprinted in me. But, but, um, but dramatically speaking, for me on the page, it's interesting because 
in a small town, people think they know each other. And, you know, they don't, because nobody ever really knows anybody, really. But, um, but they think they know each other. And so it's interesting for me to have um, different points of view. I love different points of view. And so if there's one character and you see her interacting with a certain person, you think, okay, that's their relationship, that's who she is. And then you see her interacting with a different person, you realize, oh, she's different with that person because that's how we are. I mean, you know, we all... So the slants, I think of this as like slants of sunlight coming in at different angles in small towns. And it's more interesting to me. Yeah. There's a lot in this book about mothers and daughters. Um, there's a lot of mother-daughter relationships, and a lot right. of them are mothers who have disappointed daughters. Right. What was it you were, first of all, in a broad sense, what was it that you were trying to explore about that mother-daughter relationship? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know. I just was doing it, you know. I was just doing it. Yeah. And then I, I realized, oh, there's another mother-daughter story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because it's, of course, the mother-daughter story is what's at the heart of My Name is Lucy Barton. And then there's a number of, again, as I said, those kinds of stories in this book. But one of the things I enjoyed in both books is the banter that goes on between the mother and the daughter and the way they talk about other people. Right. And they're different. They're very different mothers and different daughters. So it's not like I'm doing the same old relationship, she said defensively. (laughs) (laughs) Well, a couple. Of, well, in, in uh, one, Lucy Barton's mother was not a nice woman to her much of the time, and was apparently physically abusive of her. Um, the Nicely's mother uh, ran off, and um, uh, they were all terribly ashamed of that. Um, well, that time period in history, right? And it's a uh, time Mississippi in Mary place. also, at a late age, right. runs off with a man and infuriates her daughter as a result of that. You have no idea what you were trying to explore with all these errant mothers? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I... No. <laughs> but, and now I know your own mother is a very good storyteller from what I understand. Oh, she's a fabulous storyteller. Yeah. And I wondered if you and she had the kind of banter, you know, banter back and forth, or would have those kinds of conversations where you'd look at other people and right, thoughts about Right, a lot. I mean, you know, growing up, I, and, and that's in that article as well, that I, I can remember being a young um, kid and watching, you know, sitting in the car with my mother and just watching people walk by. Not that many people walked by, but, you know, when somebody did walk by, she would say something like, oh, that woman, you know, mm, she doesn't seem to be too happy to go home. I would be like, oh, you know, like, you know, and and more recently, actually, just a few years ago, I was sitting in a hotel room with my mother in Maine, and she looks out the window, and she goes, hmm, second wife, <laughs> and, and it was funny, because I thought, and I said to her, I said, mom, how do you know that's a second wife, come on, and I went to the window, and I was like, oh, second wife, <laughs> so, you know, she certainly, what she is your, has she read this book? Um, she has, yes. And she's read Lucy Barton? Yes. So yes. what did she think of them? Did she has always told me that every book um, is better than the one before it. Nice. It is. Yeah. It is. Do people think that My Name is Lucy Barton is about you and your mother, and is that frustrating to you and her at all? You know, I don't know. I don't think... You know, at first I was a little worried about it because I made Lucy a writer, and that just seemed to me to be so awkward. And also maybe boring because writers are not very interesting people, really. But um, but when I decided to make her a writer, I, w- I was a little concerned. I thought, oh, people might think this is me. But you know, it's not. It's just. I mean, I understand Lucy very well. But Lucy's background was not my background, and you know, my mother is not Lucy's mother, and we both know that. So. Right. Right. And Lucy tries to go home in this book. I mean, she doesn't try. She right. goes home in right. this book. And she has, starts having a decent sort of visit with her brother, and then her sister comes along, and her sister's just full of anger. Yeah. And that's where we see, and also uh, in an earlier book, uh, in an earlier story with Patty Nicely, we meet her niece, who's also pretty full of anger. And that's where we see that there's been a legacy, there's a legacy here of what happened to the Barton family right. and to what the parents did right. to them. 
Uh, can you talk about right. that uh, just a little bit more? Well, um, that, that was sort of um, interesting to watch it unfold because, you know, I, like all of a sudden I realized, oh, this girl's going to be, she's going to be Lucy's niece. And so that, she she you know, she visits took Patty place. Nicely, who's the guidance counselor right. at the high Patty school. Right, Patty Nicely's the guidance counselor. And she counselor. comes in and she is a hostile teenager. She's a very angry young woman, and and then I realized, oh okay, so we'll have that, you know. And then I played around with. Her. I wasn't sure that I wanted Lucy to actually show up in this book in third person. I just didn't know about that, but then I I did, and I and when it had so Lucy does actually make an appearance, but it's third person. It's not her voice. So. Um, and, and then Vicki, her sister, you know, and, and in My Name is Lucy Barton, she says, you probably would think that Vicki and I would be close, but we weren't because we were equally scorned and, and viewed the world, you know, equally, you know, with, with fear. And, and so that you know, it, I mean, if you've read My Name is Lucy Barton, you know that they weren't close as kids, and now they're really not close, but if you read the book, you'll realize. That I should ask happen. you while we're on that. <laughs> it, I've, I've seen people online uh, in social media wondering whether they have to read My Name is Lucy Barton no. in order to read this book. No, I don't think so. I, I don't think so either. No, uh, no, I don't think at all. I but mean, I think it, is, it enriches it yeah. in, in, in many ways. I mean, I hope so. Yeah. But, but no, they, they very much stand alone, yeah. actually. How much did you think, have to think through each of the Barton children and how their upbringing affected them? Because they all came out so differently. Right. I didn't really think it through because I don't think through things. I just write things, you see. There's a difference. Uh -huh. um, I, just, I just have the character... And I just say, okay, well, let's see. He's sitting in the chair. Now, what's he going to do? He's going to run his hand across that filthy wall, you know, which he tried to clean the house. And you know, so I, so I just, I just sit with the characters, and then, but, I mean, I guess I think, but I don't think consciously until the very end when I have to tie it all together. Well, that's what I was going to say. Do you have an end in sight when you're beginning it, or just no, 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 and I don't write anything from beginning to end. Oh, you don't. How no. do you write it? I write it in scenes. Yeah. I write pieces of scenes, or maybe a whole scene, but I will write different scenes. Um, it's very, very messy, you know, because I write by hand, and there's all these papers everywhere, and, and, and I lose some of them. Sometimes I'll find one, I go, oh, <laughs> didn't make it in. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, may, I think, I tell myself anyway that my mind sort of knows what's going on in the mess, and that if it didn't make it in, it wasn't supposed to, but but I will write scenes, and like I'll write different pieces of scenes for different stories, and then the scenes will begin to coalesce. They'll begin to come together, or not. And if they don't, then they're tossed. So you're not writing one story at a time, even? You're no. Um, there's always a point in time when one story or one book will call my attention, and then I will have to give my full attention to that, you know, as it's really presenting itself as a real thing. Then I will, but but I but I'm frequently writing different things at the same time. So one of the themes running through this book, I think, and through Lucy Barton's life, is that there's a lot of people in this book who are weighted down with a kind of pain that that they carry from earlier on in their life, either childhood or an experience. For instance, there's a Vietnam vet in right. this in this right. book, right. and his story is very interesting. I, I wrote down the name of it. Maybe you remember it. It's the Hit it's thumb theory. The hit, th the hit thumb theory of pain. And I think it's a really interesting theory, and the story itself illustrates it unbelievably well. Oh, I'm so glad you like that. But, so tell us about what the hit thumb theory of pain is and why it's in this right. book. Well, Charlie McCauley, who is the Vietnam vet, you know, he was a reverberation of um, Lucy Barton's father, who was just desperately destroyed by World War II. And Charlie McCauley is a man who's been really destroyed by his Vietnam, Vietnam experience. And that, you know, so I wanted these little reverberations. And so Charlie, who's, um, you know, running around this town, well, walking around this town, is, is, has a theory that he developed as a child when he was, 
hammering nails into his grandfather, you know, shingling uh, the garage, I mean, the house, his father's house, his grandfather's house, and he would hit his thumb instead of the nail, he realized that there would be a moment of, oh, that didn't seem to hurt so much, and then would come the crash and crush of real pain, and so the hit thumb theory is his experience, and he, and he realized that it was true in the war, and it's been true in his life, and it's certainly true in the story, that, you know, he's, he thinks he's going to be okay, and then it arrives. But what's interesting is that he has an emotional experience, a painful emotional experience occurs in the book, and he goes and he waits for the pain to come, and it's not just a matter of him waiting for the pain to come, he needs and he wants the pain to come. Well, by the very end of the story, he realizes, oh, wait, what if it doesn't come? Because what does that mean if it doesn't well, come? Well, if it doesn't come, it means that he's like the men that he's seen who are even worse off than he is from their own experiences. And, and he, who's, I think the word is whose lack then defines them. So there are people, if they can't feel pain, then he realizes, oh, that's going to be the worst thing of all. That would be like being dead. So he's actually, at the very end of the story, he's really almost praying for the pain to come. Yeah. If you read reviews of this book, you're going to see the word grace a lot. Um, graceful writing, and reviewers talk about moments of grace that are spread through the book, because there are moments of pain as well. And so the moments of grace, I think, you use in a sort of redemptive way. Would you... Is that, is that I think how you so. would put I it? I do think so. You know, it was... Years ago, I began to realize that um, sort of in a semi-conscious way, I began to realize that there is uh, there that I do write about redemption in my work, and I think that's clearly here. That well, there are these moments of, clear, clear. <laughs> sort of where people are <laughs> something happens but, where people are comforted. Uh, yeah. To go back to the Patty Nicely story, it's actually reading the book that 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 gives her a sort of moment of yeah. redemption and where she looks at the world a little differently and goes back and approaches this bratty teenager in a very, right. in a very different right. way. Right. There's also some things about faith in here. Right. Um, the janitor, uh, who uh, yeah. in his story, he goes to visit um, Lucy's brother and learns something during this visit which really shakes his faith. And I wondered how you, you view faith, how these characters, how important is faith to them? Well, I think to Tommy Guptill, it was enormous. I mean, he really, he had lived his whole life feeling that he had had this relationship with God. And, and then it gets, you know, maybe altered. We're not sure, but it feels like it could be altered by the end of that story. And so that's, you know, terrifying for him. Um, but it's left ambiguous because, because I think that these things are ambiguous. And I think, you know, again, the reader will bring what they need to to complete the story themselves. As a writer, how do you find that balance that, that will be, you think will be satisfying for a, a reader of leaving that, right. that sense of ambiguity, not quite having the answer, and yet satisfying the reader, making the reader feel like this was a complete and satisfying right. story? Right, right. That's, um, I think, I, I, it's just an intuitive thing. I mean, I hope I do it, but, but, but that is what I'm trying to do. And so um, I, it's just somehow intuitive. And I'm, all, I'm always thinking of reader, the reader as I write. Um, you know, at the very beginning, maybe not so much as the characters are emerging from, you know, the mess on my table. But, but I rather early on begin to think, okay, the reader will need this, as I, put, as I pull all these scenes together. I think, well, the reader will need to enter the book this way, and the reader will then need to, you know, it's like taking a break from Olive. The reader will need to take a break from Olive Kittredge, for heaven's sakes. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so it's, it's, it's kind of like I'm doing a dance with the reader. So I think about, you know, I have an but idea. But we loved Olive Kittredge, I have to say. Not just the book, I mean... No, that's oh, good. No, I, I mean, that's great. I'm glad you loved her. Yeah. Does, do you want your characters to be likable, or do you care if they're likable? I, or? I don't, I don't, I, I don't care if, I, look, I love all my characters. That's the story. You know, when I, when I write, one of the really wonderful things for me about being a writer is that when I go to the page, I suspend judgment. 
and it's so freeing. It's just so, it's so wonderful because I just don't care. I mean, I'm just there to report on these people and to explain this is life. This is what these people are going through. And I don't, I just love them. I just totally love them. And so I don't care what they do. But then I understand that the readers may care. But I don't. And so that's helpful. You see. (laughs) Now, do you believe, as your title suggests, do you believe that anything is possible? No. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to end on that note, but not end, because now I'm going to open the floor to questions if anybody's ready to be brave enough to come up and ask a question. I know people have questions. Hi. Hi. I have a question as to um, your relationship with your mother and your relationship with your daughter. Yeah. And whether you um, tend to observe things out the hotel window or uh, the car and stimulate your daughter to think the same way. Yes. You know, it's funny because she's... um, well, first of all, I'm just so crazy about... I just have to tell you, so crazy about my daughter. That, I'm just telling you that. <laughs> um, you know, she's just so smart. <laughs> I'm just, anyway, the point is, she's, just, she's fun. She's a great deal of fun. And so she was raised in New York City and, and, you know, and not in Maine as I was, but, but she has that eye, and we have so much fun when we're watching people or making observations about life. And is there anything about your, you see yourself in your mother that you d- try to tamp down or... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this, uh, second question is, yeah. um, or third, um, you say you love your characters. Do yeah. You, would you want to be friends with them? I feel like I am friends. That you are. Okay. (laughs) Anybody else? So does that friendship form in the writing as you're writing? Yeah, it does. Because, you know, I spend so much time with them alone. It's it's a funny thing, you know. Um, And it, it has occurred to me sometimes that I suppose it's almost a form of madness. Because I know that they're not... Well, no, if I didn't know, they weren't real. Well, whatever. I know, that, I know they're not real, but they really feel very real to me. And so, thank goodness I'm published and, you know, <laughs> not just talking to these people. So I'll keep talking. And if, if anybody wants to come, come up, stand at the mic, and then we'll turn around and we'll, we'll uh, ask you, get you to ask the question. So I'm kind of fascinated by that whole um, writer's relationships to the characters because, as I say, I've talked to a lot of writers. And um, because I don't write fiction and yeah. would love to be able to, but really just it doesn't happen, you know, because <laughs> I'm a journalist. Right, you know, so right, right. Uh, it's really hard for me to understand that what it is that the writers go through with their characters. Yeah. I interviewed um, a writer once who said, when it's over... It's, it's really sad for me, and, um, but then I have to put my characters on a train and I send them away. <laughs> like, like literally, yeah. that I have to send them away from me. It makes me really sad. Yeah. And, it's, it's, and I know that writers spend an awful lot of time alone. Right. So it, it is a little bit hard for people to quite grasp what, ha- I think it's what, very, the, what happens. I think it's very hard for people to grasp because, honestly, I don't even know how, what I'm doing in a certain way. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to put it into words, so it's, it's really understandable that people don't know what happens when the writer's sitting there alone right. day after day. It's like, what are you, you know? I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. But I do, on some level. Right. know what I'm doing. But. When you started creating these characters, when you were writing Lucy Barton, and you started creating these characters, and they started, you started realizing, oh, I can write more about these characters, and you were, you were writing those notes... Did, did it change during the process of writing the book what, when you first thought of the Nicely Girls and what had happened to them and who they were? Yeah. Did that evolve? It, it, it changes a lot. It always changes, yes. Because I don't have a full-length idea. I just have a little snippet. Yeah. And so it changes a lot. 
and which I consider a good thing because if I'm not surprised, then the reader won't be surprised, you know. So I, I think that's important. Talking about the Nicely Girls, one of the stories, the, Lin, the Linda Nicely yeah, story. Yeah, the not-so-nicely Nicely Girls. <laughs> that takes place away from the town. She's left the town, and she has this very strange and kind of creepy arrangement yeah. with that her yeah, husband has. Creepy. Maybe you can, and, and I'm wondering how, where that story came from, how that evolved. You know, um, Maybe you can explain it a little bit. <laughs> I, don't, that's, that's, I don't know where that story came from. That's, that's a creepy story. And, um, well, the, the husband is a, a peeping Tom, yeah, kind well, of, with yeah, electronic equipment. Yeah, he's like a super peeping Tom. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just realized, it did, but that part came to me as I was working on Linda nicely in her situation. I thought, wait a minute, let's just go for it. Let's just make him really creepy. So I did. It's because it's <laughs> she did, <laughs> and it's quite different from the other stories, I think. Yeah, and it's and I also the idea that Linda and Patty are sisters was very interesting to me because um, they shared that wound, and yet they're very different people, and we see that in families all yeah. the time. Well, we see that in the Barton family as well that exactly. they share the wound. Siblings very different. come out different. Oh. Go ahead. Hi, thank Hi. you. Um, I am terrified of snakes, oh, and yeah. oh, you're, yeah. that scene you wrote of, the, of right. her trapped in the... Where did that come from? I'm terrified of snakes. <laughs> I can almost not even say the word, so we'll just not. But I am very scared of those things. And, Maybe um, you can explain what the situation right. is for those who so haven't in, read it. My name is Lucy Barton. There's an old truck. Her father has a truck, and the child is put in the truck for various reasons, you know, because there's nobody to babysit or whatever. So Lucy found herself in the truck, locked in the truck at different times in her life. And at one point, one of these things came in to the truck. And that, that came to me um, at a later draft. I was going over it, and then all of a sudden I thought, wait a minute, they're in farmland. Let's do that. And I, I, just, I just couldn't believe I did it. Because I just am so frightened of them. I almost wish you hadn't. Yeah. Thank you. I know, I'm sorry. I understand. I really understand. But it just, it just came to me. I, just thought, I kept picturing that truck and the farmland around it. And I thought, no, 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 wait a minute. This, you know, oh, oh, horrible. I also wonder if you would share um, some of the books that have inspired you or things that you have enjoyed reading. Right. I think, um, I think really the writers that had the deepest influence on me would be Alice Munro and William Trevor. Um, they were such bookends to my... Such great short story writers. Oh, they were just yeah. wonderful, wonderful, and, and different. Yeah. You know, Alice Munro has so much authority on the page, and William Trevor has this light, lovely touch, and so they were very, um, very big in my life as a writer. And then all the Russians, I just love the Russians, two pieces. Um, well, you'll be happy to know I read a review today where Tolstoy was, the ghost of Tolstoy was raised. I forget where it was, but look it up. <laughs> oh, well, I don't anyway. know, do you read reviews? No. Okay. I wouldn't either if I were you. <laughs> Just because I wouldn't. Yeah, Hello. Exactly. Hi. Hi. Uh, when my book group read Lucy Barton, people there were certain women who thought it was very unrealistic that she would be there for her mother when her mother had been such a terrible person to her. And it was interesting that the people who had the best relationships with their mothers were the ones who thought that. Those of us who had difficult mothers understood right. that draw, and I'm just wondering what you would think about that. Right. It's interesting. That's very interesting, because I don't know what happens in book clubs for the most part. So that's, you know, it's interesting to hear that. Um, and I think that that's, that's interesting because the relationship that is good with the mother, it seems to not allow their imagination to be, to go where it doesn't want to go. Because if you have a good, nice, cozy relationship with your mother, then you're just not going to believe it and that's that. But, so, I don't mean to be, you know, dissing your... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, it's, it sounds to me like their imagination can't go there. Um, 
No, I was the one who thought it was very realistic. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah. I understand, mm -hmm. right. And, I, and yeah. in, my mind, <laughs> in my mind, it was completely realistic because, you know, she loves her mother. Mm -hmm. Just loves her, wants her, need, you know. She's her mother. Right. Yeah. Well, so. I love, I can't wait to read this one. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Stories are so internal. They're yeah. such internal stories. And it makes um, you think that there's a plot-driven world and a story-driven world. And I just wonder if you feel like there are plot-driven people versus story-driven people and that that's what drives the kind of writer you are. Interesting. Well, you know, I'm not plot-driven because, you know, I don't even like the word plot. Listen to it. Plot. <laughs> what kind of word is that? Um, so, you know, but, but I'm interested, I've always been interested in, in the internal versus the outward world. I mean, we all, live in, we all live in the external world and we all bump into each other in that world and we have relationships in that world, but we all have an interior life, I think but I don't know because I've never been anybody else. So, but I think that most of us have some sort of internal life and the, the um, juxtaposition between the internal and the external has always, always been so interesting to me. And so I don't know. I mean, that now, now I'm thinking maybe people don't have as much of an internal life as I think they do. Hmm. And so they, so they look for plots. <laughs> <laughs> And just as a follow-up, Olive Kitteridge was very internal, and yeah. I, it just, it's yeah. glued to me, yeah. so Sorry. thank you for <laughs> yeah. that. Um, oh, well, okay. But I wonder how you got to that point, because there's such an age, and a, that was a different, like how you even saw that story. Right, you mean because I was younger when I yeah. wrote that? Yeah, I was, I was younger when I wrote that, oh. and it was interesting to me later when I thought about it, that that I wrote, a, you know, at a younger age, wrote about an older woman. Um, she came to me very vividly, and boy, once she arrived, she was there. So I just, I just felt like I knew her. I just felt like I knew her, and um, and also, you know, as a writer, I mean, I I have listened all my life. I just listen and listen and listen. And as Jim Burgess says in The Burgess Boys, you know, people are always telling you who they are, uh, hmm. which I liked giving him that line. But the point is, <laughs> you know, they kind of are in a way. And so if you listen carefully, you can really get an awful lot of information about other people. I think most people just aren't listening that much. But, you know, it's been my job. So thank you. Can I just ask a follow-up? When you yeah. say Olive really came to you, how did she come to you? She arrived, um, I, was, I was unloading the dishwasher, and, um, and I saw, I'm, I don't mean I saw, I envisioned a large woman standing by a picnic table. I don't have a picnic table. My parents never had a picnic table. I don't know where the picnic table came from, but I'm just saying I saw this large woman standing by a picnic table at her son's wedding thinking to herself, it's high time everybody left. <laughs> and I thought, I've got to get that down. And I did. And that was when all of, she just showed up like that. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Well, uh, con coincidentally, my question sort of builds on the discussion of plot and of external. Uh, I had the chance to hear you speak at uh, Washington and Lee a few years ago before the Olive Kittredge uh, television version right. had come out. Right. And as I recall, you said, uh, as I recall, you said that that team uh, uh, was self-sufficient; that they didn't get or need or want input from you. Right. So as two things, I was wondering what you thought of that very successful, very well-received right. um, TV version, and I wondered if it should happen that this book is uh, made into a movie or TV. Would you want to have more input, or did you like that process well enough right. to repeat it? 
Right. I thought, I thought they did a wonderful job, so I was very happy with it. Um, and I, I was very relieved as well when I saw it, because I, I, I realized, I thought, oh, well, could have not been so good. But it was. I mean, I thought it was. So I was, I was very pleased. I don't think Frances McDormand looks like the olive that I had envisioned, but she didn't have to. She's, she does her own olive. And I thought she did it really well. And Richard Jenkins was just wonderful. So I was very pleased with it. And I didn't mind not being a part of it at all because I don't know anything about movies. And I'm not, that's not what I, my job is. Um, and The Burgess Boys is being done by Robert Redford for HBO. And, and I have spoken with a screenwriter a number of times because he lives in New York. And so, and he drops his kid off at school near where I live. So we meet, you know, we met him a number of times. And there's, stuff that he needs to know about the Somali community and everything like that. So I, you know, I just like him, and he's easy to be around. And um, So I'm a little bit, tiny bit more involved, but, but not really. And I don't, don't want to be, <laughs> you know. It's just not my thing. But thank you. Hi. When you brought up two things, plot and then the Burgess boys, I feel like the Burgess Boys has a plot. Yeah, I guess it does. But um, what is it? <laughs> I'm serious. It's, like, it's the drama of the two clashing communities set in motion right. by the frozen goat head right. being right, thrown in. Right, right, and, um, and I also felt like that book you talked about in an um, article that you did a lot of research. Yes, spent I Spent time. Oh, I had and, to. And I'm sort of guessing maybe some of your other books you didn't have to do that sort of research. Well, I did with Abide With Me. I had to research for about six years or, or what it felt like to be a congregational minister. I really had to give myself an independent study in what it would be to f- be a congregational minister in 1959. Right. So right, I had to yeah. go to the Bangor Theological Seminary and find catalogs. This lovely librarian got me catalogs of the courses that he would have been taking in 42 or whenever he would have been there. And so I really had to study that. And, you know, I would ride the subway with the Psalms, <laughs> you know, like just memory, you know, because th- these would be his reference points. So I did have to do a lot um, of research for Abide With Me. And then with the Somali community, I had to do a tremendous amount of research. Do you think that you'll revisit that community in any future fiction? I don't know. I really <laughs> just don't know. I don't know. Thank do you, you, though. Hi. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the writing process? You talked about it a little obliquely about this piece, but the mechanics to you, where do you do it? How do you do it? Do you look for a certain number of words a day? How long take you to write a book? Yeah. I don't, I don't look for a certain number of words a day. I don't even know how many words are a page. 250? Yeah. Anyway, um, I, don't, I don't do that. I don't even remotely do that because it's too um, constructed. So what I, what I do is, at the beginning of a book, which can last for a few years, that whole beginning process, I just, well, I'll tell you what I do. I, I sit down and, um, and I've done, I learned to do this years ago when my time was more limited, you know, and I only had like two hours that I could work. And I learned that if I could take whatever emotion, and I realize that every person at a given moment is feeling something more than they're feeling the other, you know, other things. And it, it could just be dreading the dentist, it could be wondering if the babysitter's going to show up, it could be worrying that your husband's having an affair, whatever. But there's something that's like itching a little bit more than others. And I realized if I could take that emotion, whatever I was feeling, if I could take it and transpose it into a different emotion even, but just the energy of that emotion into a character, into a scene, then I would have something that had a heartbeat to it. And so that's when I began writing in scenes. And I realized that, you know, I had to be using something that was coming from myself with, with, a, with an urgency. And so that's what I still do. That's what I still do for the first few years or, or whatever it is when I'm writing, when I'm starting a book. I will just continue to write different scenes. You write in the same place every day? Um, pretty much, pretty much, yes. In Maine, I have a studio, and in New York, I, I work 
in my house, I mean, in my apartment, but um, in our apartment, but I can actually write anywhere. I don't write anywhere, but I can, and I have, you know, because it's, it will, if something comes to me, then I, need, then I need to pay attention to it. And it doesn't even have to be more than 20 minutes. I mean, if, in, if I'm, you know, in an airport or something like that, but I need to make sure I get it down, if it, if it is coming to me in that way. Um, but, but I do work on, I, I try and work on a regular basis because it's my job. So I try and do this five days a week, you know, um, from morning until a late lunch. You know, I keep pushing lunch off because there's something about eating that, you know, makes me tired <laughs> or something. I don't know. I just, but, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Sounds like you've got to jot things down sometimes. Like you yes. really, things really do come yes. to you. Yes. And do those come in quiet moments? I mean, do they ever come in moments where you're in the middle of a, yeah. I don't know, a party or something, and you feel like, well, oh my God, I got to, you know, but, but <laughs> not a party with other people in some way, and you have to um, go off and jot it down, or they've, you know, it's come to me on on the subways, and it's come to me in airports, you know, in, but I'm not with. It's not like I'm traveling alone. Yeah. At those times. So you are usually alone. So I'm, yeah, yeah, so I'm alone in my thoughts. And then I'll realize, oh, 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 let me get this down about so-and-so. Your book was one of the most emotionally true things I've ever read. Thank and you. thank you for that. I so glad. I'm finished glad. reading it one night, and then the next day started over and read it again. Um, I did wonder throughout the book where Lucy's anger was. Yeah. I didn't see anger toward the mother, toward the father, toward the husband that I would just like to slap a couple yeah. of times. And That's what did you do with that? Because I, I was, later you talked about the ruthlessness that she had to have and that she right. possessed. Right. Right. That's, that's, um, that's an interesting question. And I think of Lucy as a person who's... Um, She's not, you know, obviously she's got to have her anger, and she does in this book. She, she has her expressive moments in this book. But um, in her first-person narration, it's very different because she's telling the story. And I just, um, I didn't, she just isn't, anger is not the largest part of her, even remotely. There's just this, you know, fine thread of her voice. And so um, I just, you know, it's funny because I remember reading an article one time um, by John Updike when he was talking about anger and he said that he didn't feel anger. And I thought, that's so interesting. And then he went on to say he didn't feel it because he'd been raised not to. And so I think that, you know, I think there could be something like that about Lucy's background. You know, there was so much trauma in her background that that instead of being angry, which is an active emotion, she's more, you know, floated away from that feeling. It's how I see it. The sister. You gave sister. a lot of the anger to the sister. Sister's got, and in that scene, in this book, in the sister gets very angry at her. Yeah. And it's yeah. clear that she's very uncomfortable she can't handle the anger. No, you're exactly right. That's why I'm saying Lucy is not... She's, she's a person who doesn't really know how to be angry. Yeah, even, even after she had experienced a lot of things that make most people yeah. angry. And yeah. then I also wondered if at... It was almost a casual mention um, when she connected to the second husband who had also come from poverty and yeah. also had a special spark. Right. So I wondered if you were kind of coming full circle? Yeah. It seemed, that, this is that, that seemed to me emotionally truthful, that somebody who had um, come from what she came from as she aged would find somebody that also had suffered. That, that seemed to me to be... Balance. Yeah. yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I deliberately did that. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Hi. 
I was wondering when you started writing and what made you want to start writing. Right. I started writing when I was old enough to write sentences. I mean, I was so young when I started writing. And the reason I did it was because my mother told me to. Mm -hmm. And um, I think my mother wanted to be a writer. That's always been my Tough. sense. But she, she really is the reason I'm a writer, and not just because of her observations, which have been so energizing to me, but, um, but because she told me. She said, write down what you did today. She just did that immediately. She didn't, to my brother. He, she, uh, so she must have seen me as the writer, and I, so I became one, <laughs> you know. And I, and I just remember, I don't have a mem, I mean, well, I guess many of us don't, but I mean, I don't, I just began to think in terms of sentences at a very young age, is what I'm saying. And so I'm, so I, I just wrote what I did that day. <laughs> and then I never stopped. I just never stopped. That's really what happened. Thanks. When did the fiction part of you as a writer start? Right. Because that you were writing about yourself. When did the right. stories? The, early on, um, you know, there, when I was really young, like maybe ten or eleven, I thought I might be a poet, because Edna Saint Vincent Millay had come from Maine, and she was a poet, and she had these poems for young people that my mother gave me, and I was so enchanted with them. And then I thought maybe I'd be a poet, but that lasted probably about you know six months, from like nine and a half to ten, and then I realized that I was just going to be a, a fiction writer. We have time for two more questions. We have two more questions out there? Or should I ask the two more questions? Oh, we got one. There we go. Um, I was just wondering what sort of, if you've had any kind of, other than just writing always, any kind of formal training in writing? Oh, yes. I, I studied with Gordon Lish, who, um, I don't know if, Anyway, he was Raymond Carver's editor, and he was known as Captain Fiction back in the day. And so many, many years ago, when I first moved to New York, I, I took uh, two classes with him, and he was really frightening. I mean, it was the scariest thing. Boy. Um, I mean, he would just talk for like five hours without stopping, and if you left the room, you know, you weren't necessarily allowed back. But he was, but he was very... But I understood... The reason I took two classes was because the first time I was so terrified that I, that I understood that there were things that were being said that, were, that nobody else was saying. You know, because I would try a class or something and I would never stay with it because it was not helpful. And yet I understood that he really was naming things. He was talking about the authority on the page. And it was like, that's so helpful to think in terms of authority. You know, that's just one example. And so I took, I took the class again because I knew that I had missed stuff in my terror. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, but that, that was my training. Yeah. I, I'm sort of curious about your geography. Um, do I detect a bit of the South in your voice? Oh, that's so interesting. Oh, that's so interesting, isn't and it? That is, I think yeah. that's actually very interesting. It is. Um, I don't, I don't have any southern relatives that I know of. Well, that's interesting. No, you, you do have a, f yeah. a few. Interesting. Well, you don't have a Maine I, accent, and you grew up in no, Maine. No, I don't have a Maine accent. I don't think I've ever had a Maine accent. So once in a while when I moved away and I would talk on the phone to my parents, I could hear my voice rocking up and down a little bit, but I don't think I've ever had a Maine accent. But that's interesting. When I, when I read all of Kitteridge, I thought, oh, this is clearly written by a New Englander. Yeah, I am. And when, when I, I started this one and it was going to take place in Illinois or part of it, yeah. I thought, oh, she thinks she can write about the Midwest. Um, right. So I, I thought, I, I, which I'm, I'm from Missouri, I, I, I totally believed um, the Midwest in this book. But um, I was just curious if you have lived in different parts of the country or just uh, imagine them. You know, um, the Midwest, um, well, my, my oldest friend in New York, for, for 34 years when I met her right after I moved there. Um, she is originally from the Midwest, and so I feel like I've absorbed an awful lot of her background. She was also a Congregationalist. I mean, had been raised a Congregationalist. And, um, and then I had been to the Midwest a number of times. And then when I was writing My Name is Lucy Barton, my husband and I went out a, a couple of times to make sure that 
you know, I really was observing it correctly. We, we had wonderful trips around and, you know, just watching and making sure that the soybeans were exactly this high, <laughs> you know, as right, a, you right, know, and right. making sure that, that it was all as accurate as it could be. And it was, it was, those trips were wonderful. And I felt like I could absorb the lives of those people, you know. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Thank you. Great Thank you, to you, everybody, for standing up.